Good morning, welcome to Insiders. The Treasurer Peter Costello this week opened the doors of Parliament House in Canberra to the stench from the West. He launched a powerful attack on opposition leader Kevin Rudd for attending three meetings with disgraced former politician Brian Burke. But by the end of the week it was a ministerial colleague, Human Services Minister Ian Campbell, who had lost his job when he disclosed he'd met with Brian Burke. Senator Campbell became the victim of Peter Costello's parliamentary rhetoric. Mr Brian Burke never does something for nothing, Mr Speaker. Mr Brian Burke has now been fingered by the Crime Commission in Western Australia and three ministers have lost their jobs because of their contacts with him. Because for Mr Speaker, because anyone who deals with Mr Brian Burke is morally and politically compromised. But still the pressure remains on Kevin Rudd to more convincingly explain the nature of his meetings with Brian Burke. He is accused by the coalition of supping with the devil to win political favours. He insists his designs on the leadership was not the issue, that leadership was not discussed. But that defence is not helped by this contribution from WA union heavyweight Kevin Reynolds, who spoke to Stateline just four days after the Rudd-Burke dinner and said this in Brian Burke's defence. I know for a fact that he met with Rudd the other day when he was here. Uh, uh, that guy's got... Uh, he's a future leader of this country and he sees... Uh, that there's no problem in meeting with Brian, talking with Brian. Now, two points arise from that. One, Kevin Reynolds, a close friend of Brian Burke's, is talking publicly of Kevin Rudder's leadership material just four days after the dinner. And two, he uses Kevin Rudd's appearance at the dinner to boost Brian Burke's credibility. And more on Kevin Reynolds. He's married to Labor Party backbencher Shelley Archer, who is accused of leaking confidential documents and details of private conversations with ministers to her self-declared mentor, Brian Burke. She acted as a go-between for Mr Burke, dealing with the ministers that he didn't have under his own control. And it seems Shelley Archer is the point at which the Premier, Alan Carpenter, cannot go beyond. He says her behaviour is reprehensible, and yet he won't expel her from the party. We'll go back to that Stateline interview to get a sense of what he is up against. How do you feel about how the modern Labor Party has treated Brian Burke then if he's a friend? Because if you were a minister at the moment or a chief of staff, you wouldn't be allowed to speak to him. Um, if I was a minister or a chief of staff, I certainly would have approached Jeff Gallup to indicate that he's a family friend and that unfortunately I wouldn't be able to um, follow that dictate. Kevin Reynolds, how do you feel about how the Labor Party has treated your friend? I think it's disgraceful. Brian's made a few mistakes in his life. He's paid the price like anyone else. And, you know, Jeff, Jeff uh, dictates that people sh don't talk to Brian. Well, let me tell you, his phone runs hot and uh, half the people that uh, ring Brian are ministers and people within the Labor Party uh, because he's such a political brain. Um, you either love or hate Berkey and uh, I'm one of them who loves him. Now, Alan Carpenter, the WA Premier, once said the Labor Party had a choice. They can have people like him or they can have people like Brian Burke. It seems that choice is still being made. Our program guest this morning is Labor's most senior shadow minister from the West, Stephen Smith. His views and the views of Paul Kelly and the panel coming up on Insiders. But first, for more on the Brian Burke saga and the other news overnight, it's good morning, Katrina Blowers. Thanks, Barry. Good morning. West Australian Labor MP Graeme Edwards has offered a further defence of opposition leader Kevin Rudd over a dinner he attended, organised by the disgraced former WA Premier Brian Burke. In a statement issued this morning, Mr Edwards says at no stage was he aware Mr Burke had arranged for Mr Rudd to be the guest of honour at the dinner in August 2005. Nor was he informed that Mr Burke had extended an email invitation to others to meet Mr Rudd at the dinner. The move follows the resignation of Human Services Minister Senator Ian Campbell over a meeting he had with Mr Burke last year and a renewed attack by the Prime Minister on Mr Rudd who's maintaining his leadership aspirations were not discussed at the dinner. And Mr Rudd has questions to answer. He has to explain and come clean about the true purpose of those meetings and his explanations are increasingly unbelievable with evidence as it emerges. On the question concerning uh, the details of this matter, I made a full statement uh, in Canberra last Thursday. I took nearly 60 
minutes worth of questions from all the National Press Gallery on every aspect of that and I stand by what I said on that occasion. A team from the UK has arrived in Ethiopia in an effort to find five Britons believed to be kidnapped. The Ethiopian police and army are searching a remote desert region near the border with Eritrea where the group went missing. Hundreds of thousands of people turned out in Sydney overnight for the annual Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras parade. 8,000 participants made the 29th parade the biggest procession in the event's history. And Barry, I'll be back with more news at 11 o'clock. Katrina, thank you. And now to our program guest, Labor's Shadow Minister for Education, Stephen Smith. This week he announced Labor's policy for a national curriculum in our schools. But like everybody else, he was distracted by the whole Brian Burke episode. Stephen Smith joins me now from Perth. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Barry. Doesn't it defy credibility to uh, assert, as Kevin Rudd does, and now uh, Graham Edwards as well, that leadership was not discussed at that Burke dinner? Well, Graeme Edwards overnight has released a statement which says that he didn't know that Brian Burke was telling people that Kevin would be the guest of honour. But Barry, let's, let's get sensible and real here. Senior shadow ministers go around the countryside displaying their wares and articulating Labor policy. And Kevin is one of a number of shadow ministers who over the last few years have been described in terms of being a possible future leader of the party and a possible prime minister. So the fact that Kevin as a senior shadow minister is going around the place doing dinners, is, is, is doing his job. Uh, what Graham Edwards has made it clear is that he, Graham Edwards, a good and decent and honest person, a person who John Howard has praised in the Parliament for his integrity, he says he didn't know about what Brian Burke was doing in terms of the details of the dinner, and Kevin says the same thing. Uh, and I think that that should be taken at its face value, yeah, we'll, and the matter left there. We'll go to how the, the me meeting was presented in a moment, but I'm talking here about what was discussed at the meeting. Kevin Rudd says leadership was not discussed, but he does say they discussed the state of federal politics. How do you talk around something like leadership when you're discussing the state of federal politics? Well, as Kevin has said, leadership wasn't uh, an issue at that point in time. But, but Barry, I wasn't at the dinner. You weren't at the dinner. Most Australians weren't at the dinner. Let's, let's cut to the chase here. Since Kevin Rudd became leader of the Labor Party, what have we had? We've had a contrast between a young and energetic and positive new leader and a Prime Minister who's worried that people are now thinking that he's had his day, he's done his time and he might be slipping and he's been a bit complacent. And so we've seen a good old-fashioned standard Liberal Party attack on the personality here. And it hasn't just started uh, with, uh, with this dinner. It has started in the course of this Parliament with Tony Abbott making outrageous attacks attacks on, uh, on Kevin and Kevin's religion. The government has been unleashing, John Howard has been unleashing his attack dogs, Costello and, uh, and uh, Abbott, and that is primarily aimed at mudslinging at Kevin Rudd because they know they are in trouble because Labor is holding out a policy program about the long-term future of our country, investing in the long-term important things like education, and the government is struggling because we know they've been complacent and we know that John Howard is slipping and we know it's not the John Howard of old. That's, that's the, the political reality here, Barry. Yeah, but you still go back to years of political experience. You'd have to act on a hunch that it was discussed. Matt Price wrote this morning that it's sort of saying that you could have a long weekend with Richie Benno and not talk cricket. I mean, that's that's how, how much credibility is at stake here. Well, Barry, if you want to talk about credibility, what, what is John Howard out there with Costello and Abbott trying to do? They're trying to dirty up Kevin Rudd. They're trying to make credibility an issue. Well, as, as, as Kevin said yesterday, if John Howard wants to make honesty and credibility an issue, that's fine. Let's have a conversation about that. Let's have a conversation about John Howard's credibility and honesty when it comes to Iraq, when it comes to children overboard, when it comes to uh, weapons for wheat, when it comes to uh, promising record low interest rates and no interest rate increases, when it comes to not having any proposals for industrial relations. They're the things that go to John Howard's credibility. Barry, some of us have been around long enough to remember that honest John was always an ironic expression. 
And there's also plenty of people these days who are saying they think John Howard has changed and they think he's, they've, that, that he has changed because he's had his day, he's done his dash, he's getting old and tired and he's slipping. And John Howard has one solution to that. It's a good old-fashioned Liberal Party mudslinging. That's what this is about. But how is it then if, uh, if Kevin Rudd turned up at the dinner almost by chance, almost at the last minute, and yet an email went out from Brian Burke, I think four days before the function, and certainly Kevin Rudd was the draw card as far as he was concerned. Well, Kevin's made it clear that he knew Brian would be at the dinner. Kevin says that he went along because Graham Edwards asked him to go along. And Graham's statement stands for itself overnight. And as we've seen from uh, the Corruption and Crime Commission here, uh, what Brian Burke does is often not known by other people who've given him information. So Kevin can't be responsible, and nor can Graham Edwards, for what Brian Burke did with that email. That's, that's about Brian Burke. Now, Kevin has also made it clear that he, he understands that he made a mistake. You know, the government's out there talking about uh, experience. Well, one of the things that comes from uh, experience, Barry, or that goes to experience is this. It's about learning from your mistakes. And the first thing you have to do in terms of learning from, from your mistakes is to understand and accept and acknowledge that you've made one. And, That's and what perhaps, Kevin has And perhaps done. Stephen Smith pay a price. Ian Campbell admitted he made a mistake and resigned. Kevin Rudd is still in his job. What's the difference? Well, well Barry, let's come to that. Uh, the price that Kevin Rudd is paying for the mistake he's made is he's got uh, Howard out there unleashing his attack dogs Costello and Abbott, making outrageous assertions about his honesty and his credibility for which there is no evidence. When it comes to Ian Campbell, uh, nothing, Barry, nothing could show more that this is just about an attempt by John Howard, another clever short-term political fix. Ian Campbell, as a Western Australian Liberal member, made the mistake of meeting with Brian Burke. He should have known better. But as John Howard said yesterday, it was a benign meeting. Ian Campbell says his, res his uh, respectability and his integrity is intact. John Howard says that he can come back as a minister potentially uh, in the next uh, parliament or indeed perhaps uh, an overseas posting like Amanda Vanstone. What John Howard has done is that he has cut Ian Campbell's throat because Ian Campbell is getting in the way of an outrageous attack on Kevin Rudd. That is what that is about. When have we ever seen from John Howard anything that goes to accountability in government, about governance in, uh, in, uh, in uh, parliamentary and ministerial affairs, about mm. standards? It, there is nothing here that goes to anything about long-term effort to improve standards or long-term policy for the well, country's it, it, future. It's it, another classic classic John Howard short-term political fix and Ian Campbell well, has paid his ministerial price for that. And it was an unusual situation because a minister quits without either the opposition or the media demanding that of him. Why didn't you demand well, it of because, him? Because, well, Barry, why Ian Campbell has been thrown overboard by John Howard is because Ian Campbell was getting in the way of the outrageous allegations that, uh, that had been so made you're, you're about saying he, he doesn't Kevin deserve, Rudd. He doesn't deserve to have lost his job. No, he lost his job because Peter Costello, having spent his morning watching the old Keating videos from Question Time, went into the Parliament and said that anyone who had any contact with Brian Burke was morally and politically compromised. But it's also consistent uh, with what Alan, Alan Carpenter has done in the West. If ministers have had contacts, they go. Well, John Howard himself said it's a benign meeting. Look, Barry, look, I have said for a long period of time that I don't think it's sensible for people to, uh, to have contact with Brian Burke. And that has been my approach for a considerable period of time. And I think when people deal with Brian Burke, they make a mistake. But let's not get carried away here with hysteria. If you have a meeting with Brian Burke, as the Corruption Commission here has shown, some people have different responses. So you can actually judge people by the response that they make to an approach. I think it was unwise of Kevin to meet with Brian Burke, and I think Kevin is paying a political price for that, and that is the attacks on his credibility. But when it comes to honesty and credibility, I'm quite happy for Kevin Rudd to stand there while John Howard attacks him on a dinner with Brian Burke, because that puts into play John Howard's credibility and John Howard's honesty and John Howard's record on long-standing things like his honesty and credibility on the war in Iraq and intelligence on the war in Iraq, what he said about industrial relations in the run-up to the last election, 
what he said about interest rates and what he and his ministers said about weapons for wheat. So if he wants credibility to be an issue, as Kevin said yesterday, bring it on right now. OK, is there anything that Alan Carpenter should now be doing apart from what he's already done? Look, Barry, hindsight here is, is a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, and uh, no one here is claiming perfect political judgment. For example, when uh, Alan Carpenter lifted the ban on ministers dealing with uh, Brian Burke, uh, he thought that his ministers would be up to the task and he under, underestimated and underappreciated, as we all did, the extent of the tentacles that had been spread. So that was a mistake and Alan's responded to that by, by the action that he has taken. And I think he'll need to do more in terms of accountability and reform measures. But hindsight here, Barry, is a wonderful thing. For example, in early uh, 2006, in February 2006, uh, Fortescue Metals and Julian Grill were traipsing around Parliament House uh, making submissions to people and briefing people on their claim for access to BHP Railway uh, in the northwest of Western Australia. BHP were doing the same thing, briefing members. I had a briefing from Julian Grill and Fortescue Metals. Now, with hindsight, maybe that was a mistake. But let's keep things in perspective here. And the perspective is this. John Howard has authorised a brutal political tack on Kevin Rudd because John Howard has got no long-term plans for investing in our country's future. He is desperately worried that Kevin Rudd is there as a new, energetic, positive opposition leader who does yeah. have views about the future of the country. That's what it's all you, about. You've made those Barry. points, but when you had that meeting with Julian Grill, was Brian Burke involved in any way? No, of course he wasn't, and Fortescue Metals were there, and it was an entirely uh, appropriate meeting where nothing untoward was suggested uh, or done. It was a formal briefing, and, I'm sh and, and I assume that Fortescue Metals and Julian Grill were briefing widely in Parliament House uh, with uh, members and senators from all political parties. Um, Tony Abbott, you, you mentioned before that he was having a go at uh, Kevin Rudd on, on religion. He did raise that again this morning on television. Um, and he talked about Kevin Rudd introducing religion into the political debate and to the point where he claims to, to be both an atheist and a Catholic. Well, I think John Howard's authorisation, John Howard's express authorisation of Tony Abbott bringing religion, divisive sectarian religion, into the, onto the floor of the parliament and into Australian public life is outrageous. John Howard sits there when Tony Abbott makes these attacks uh, on Kevin Rudd, these sectarian, divisive, religious attacks. John Howard sits there with a smile on his face because he's authorised it. This is the most uh, blatant example of divisive sectarian politics that we've seen since the 50s and 60s. Tony Abbott is out there saying that he is, you know, a, uh, a, a Catholic and a Christian. Well, to put it in Catholic or Christian terms, he is conducting himself in a very unchristian-like manner. And why is that? because Howard has authorised him to do anything or say anything to try and undermine Kevin Rudd. And that also, Barry, crystallises what the Liberal Party is on about here. We know John Howard. He will do anything, say anything, authorise anything, allow anything to occur, uh, occur at any level to try and win an election. The one thing he won't do is have a conversation with the Australian people about the long-term things we need to do to invest in our country's future, making an investment in education so that we can compete with other people and make sure that our prosperity in the future is secure. Well, we'll talk about education uh, perhaps at another, another time when we've got more time, but just on that question and finally on the national curriculum that you proposed this week, to quote Julie Bishop, you stole that idea, didn't you? Well, Barry, the, the, the issue of a national curriculum has been around for a long time. I've, the first reference I've seen to it in the 60s, John Dawkins spoke about it in the 1980s. Uh, the government has been speaking about it here. Brendan Nelson spoke about it in 2002. The real point is this. The government has done nothing about it. The government's so-called national curriculum approach is nothing more, nothing less than a proposal to beat up the states for political purposes. Our national curriculum plan is a plan for Australia to be able to beat other nations because our kids get a better education. We will work cooperatively with the states to secure a national curriculum in the first instance in the key core areas of maths and science, uh, English and history, and we'll do that cooperatively. We'll get the best of the best from all of the curriculum around the states. 
It's about having greater consistency but also ensuring that we've got rigour in the curriculum and better standards and that can only enhance the education of young Australians and also enhance our social and educational outcomes. Stephen Smith, we are out of time but thanks for your time this morning. Thanks very much, Barry. I think Maxine McHugh's decision to run for pre-selection in the seat of Bennelong is excellent. Previously I've been a Liberal voter, but I think that she stands for something new, something fresh, and Howard has had that seat for 32 years, I believe. I think the Prime Minister has made a big difference because you can't be Prime Minister and not make a big difference. I think one of the things he's contributed is um, prosperity, that the, the country's a lot more prosperous now, and especially with his tax cuts, I think that's made a big difference. But I don't think that's as important as kindness and compassion. I think the Prime Minister's done an excellent job in securing Australia. I think national security has been at the forefront of the Liberal Party um, as their agenda. We're not exactly sure yet what Maxine will offer, but I think she'll offer a professional, fresh approach. She's not a celebrity for the sake of celebrity. She's a real um, thinker, intelligent woman, and knows her politics. I have been sort of swinging all over the place over the last few years, mainly because I've always wanted to vote Labor, but there really hasn't been anyone in the last um, couple of elections that I felt like I could trust. John Howard only holds the um, balance for in 4% and I think John Howard is going to have a, a hard time, a hard yeah. fight on his hands. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. This time, this time it'll be the closest that it's ever been. And I'll just correct the record, uh, Tony Abbott didn't accuse Kevin Rudd of trying to be an atheist and a Catholic at the same time, an Anglican and a Catholic at the, sa at the, at the same time. I don't think the atheist thing would stick. <laughs> um, now, on just what we've just heard, uh, George Megalogenis, um, whether a celebrity candidate is in there against John Howard or not, you get the impression the electorate is starting to close in on him anyway in Benelong. Benelong, Benelong to all intents and purposes, is a Labor seat, demographically speaking. The only person who can hold it for the Liberal Party is John Howard. The two seats to the immediate west of uh, Benelong have already fallen to the Labor Party in the last eight years. That's uh, Lowe and Parramatta. There's a huge influx of Asian migrants in the last ten years in Benelong, and they tend to vote more often than not Labor rather than Liberal. But in Benelong, in, inter interestingly enough, they've, uh, they've stuck with Howard up until this point. Should he be worried? Well, I, I, think he'll, I think he'll win. I mean, one of the people in that uh, clip said that Maxine was a professional, and undoubtedly she is, but, but certainly Howard is too. And uh, mm. I, I, I don't think being a star or whatever counts at all, frankly, and I doubt if she'd see herself in that light. I, I think uh, unless there's a huge swing on, Howard will hold that seat. What do you think, Piers? Well, I tend to agree. And looking at the 2004 results where you had Wilkie running on the, the uh, uh, anti-Howard line... But as a Green. Uh, well, the, the Greens also had a vote and, um, uh, and Labor ran dead. Uh, and I think with Labor that'll cancel out the Green vote and so on and so forth. I think that Howard should get back. More on that issue a little later on, but we'll get back to that issue, <laughs> well, the issue that is yeah. uh, the breaking political story. The resignation, of course, of Human Services Minister Ian Campbell. And for some background and analysis on that issue, we're joined, as always, by Paul Kelly, political commentator with The Australian. Paul, good morning, welcome. How, how do you think, even before the Ian Campbell thing occurred, how damaging was the week for Kevin Rudd? I've got no doubt at all, Barry, that this was a very damaging week uh, for Kevin Rudd because it goes to the issues of political judgment and political character. And the Howard government won't let this go. John Howard will continue the campaign uh, against Kevin Rudd. What happened last Thursday was that Rudd, in relation to his meetings with Brian Burke, had to stand up and concede that he'd blundered, he'd got it wrong, he'd made mistakes. He was responsible for errors of political judgment. And now, this television footage, we'll see a lot more of this during the course of the year. And I've got no doubt the Liberal Party will use this footage in the upcoming federal election campaign. But having said all that, I think another important point to make here is that the Howard government was desperate for this sort of breakthrough. Uh, the government has been utterly unconvincing so far in taking the fight to Kevin Rudd in working out how to handle uh, Kevin Rudd. The government's been inept uh, and uh, confused for much of the last a uh, few weeks. So there's no doubt that this breakthrough is a real tonic and therapy for the government. Will it end the Rudd uh, honeymoon? Well, I'm not convinced that it, that it 
that it necessarily will end that honeymoon. Uh, we'll have to wait and see on that. But what it will do is that it will deflate the political bubble that surrounded uh, Kevin Rudd. It will be the end of the Rudd political halo. It will be the end of the Rudd mystique. And the, the Ian Campbell resignation then, what impact did that have? Uh, this shocked uh, the government, obviously. Uh, they were in a wonderful position attacking Kevin Rudd and suddenly uh, they found the whole uh, campaign backfired and led to the resignation of Ian Campbell, uh, their own minister. So it's been a surprise and an embarrassment for the Howard government. But I think the real significance of the resignation of Ian Campbell was that Howard had no choice. And what it really signals is that Howard is determined to use Campbell's resignation to continue and reinforce the campaign against Rudd. And, I mean, you can see what Howard's going to argue. He'll say, well, these are my standards. My minister resigned. Uh, what are Labor's standards? What are Kevin Rudd's standards? And so he will parade the political scalp of Ian Campbell uh, to argue that he is a centre of moral virtue. He upholds standards, standards which Kevin Rudd is not prepared to uphold. And you talk about uh, you're not convinced yet that uh, Kevin Rudd's honeymoon is over, but nevertheless, there's more to come, surely. The, he must be vulnerable into the future. I think he is. And as I said, the government will continue the campaign over the Brian Burke affair. And much of this will focus upon the dinner, the Brian Burke hosted dinner, where there are very different versions given by Kevin Rudd on the one hand and other people who attended the dinner on the other hand and, of course, along with the Brian Burke invitation. Now, uh, I think there is an explanation for this. We saw a statement overnight from Graham Edwards. It seems that what happened here was that Graham Edwards was attending the dinner, that he invited Kevin Rudd to go along with him. When Brian Burke found out about this, he exploited Rudd. In a sense, I think Rudd probably walked into a trap. Uh, Bert, uh, Burke turned the entire event uh, into a focus around Kevin Rudd, thereby exploiting that situation for his own clients and for his own colleagues. Uh, so I think we'll hear a lot more about this in coming weeks. I think it's unrealistic to think that the leadership was not discussed, but the point to make here is to see it in context. <coughs> as far as I know, Kevin Rudd never sought any support from Brian Burke or advice about the Labor leadership in terms of his campaign against Kim Beasley. OK, and I just want to ask you finally about the, uh, the nuclear power plant issue that arose during the week because three businessmen, it was revealed, phoned the Prime Minister um, to, to tell him of this and, and this is how he responded to that phone call. I had a discussion Order. with Ron Walker. I'm very happy to tell the world that one Saturday morning when Ron rings me, he said to me, what about the middle of last year, he said that uh, he and Hugh Morgan and Robert de Crepney had decided to register a company that could be interested in nuclear power. And I said, well, that's a great idea, Ron. Now, a great idea, Ron. That's encouragement. Uh, what, what does that tell you? I think what that grab tells us, Barry, is that John Howard is utterly determined uh, to ensure that in this year's election campaign and the run-up to the election, the option of nuclear power is on the table as one of the issues. Now, he doesn't want the election to be a referendum on nuclear power, and I don't believe the election will be a referendum on nuclear power. What Howard wants to do is to position himself as somebody prepared to look at all the possible solutions to climate change and say, well, government shouldn't ban the nuclear option. Let's establish this on the basis that uh, commercial factors predominate and that companies make commercial decisions about energy. Is there a risk for Howard in this? Well, I think there is, because Labor will wage a scare campaign about it. The whole debate is somewhat artificial, of course, because nuclear power will, will not be uh, viable in a commercial sense for a long time yet. Uh, but I think both Howard and Rudd see opportunities for themselves in this nuclear debate. Paul Kelly, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Well, let's go back now to the uh, Burke, Rudd, Campbell thing. Does it all swing on, on who do you believe? It's going to be very hard to sort out. I mean, I, I'm willing to believe that uh, Kevin Rudd wouldn't have said at that meeting with people, he'd, at that dinner with people he'd never met, that I'm you know, dearly wanting to, to knock off Kim Beasley's leader because it might leak out. But it, it might well have come out that he said something like, well, down the track, of course, I wouldn't mind having a go. I mean, I think one of the intriguing things here, I think, is that Ian Campbell's uh, been forced to resign when he says, I've done nothing wrong. 
Uh, it's a very unusual circumstance where, where a minister resigns. Yeah, they, you raise that. Uh, so let, let's get Ian Campbell's um, um, analysis of that and he explains mm. why it is mm. that, he, that he's quitting. It's an interesting point. I paid a very high price, uh, but it is a price that's worth paying because we need to ensure uh, that the government is re-elected uh, and that this person who wants to be uh, Prime Minister, who has now for the last few days concealed the truth about his meetings with Mr Burke, is brought to account. Uh, and I think that uh, you should now focus your cameras, cameras on him. So he's saying he's not doing this in the national interest, he's doing it in the interest of his own political party, isn't he? We've uh, returned to the ministerial standards of the first term. Any minister that gets the government into trouble is, uh, is cut free, whether they did something wrong or not. Um, there are a couple of resignations in the first term that were for seriously trivial matters. And I think in this instance John Howard couldn't have uh, handled this any differently. Ian Campbell would have been sitting in Parliament when Peter Costello set the moral high bar uh, that high when he said that you'd be politically and morally compromised if you had a meeting. Now, if Ian Campbell didn't walk into the PM's office immediately after question time and say, oh, by the way, I had a 20-minute meeting with him and we discussed the property development, um, then that alone would have cost him his job. But he didn't, did he? When did he finally raise it with the Prime Minister? I think he, I think he raised it with the Prime Minister's office after the Australian contacted him. He so didn't. it wasn't something he was about to declare. He didn't have he a meeting. Did, but he didn't think he'd done anything yeah. wrong. Well, it wasn't a meeting on his own with Burke. It was a meeting with representatives of the racetrack at which Burke attended. I mean, uh, they were briefing him on a pro development proposal. But I think but it was open to him to say, hey, yeah. but I think if Brian you, Burke, I, think I, think I don't want to Kevin, talk to you. I think if they're going to go, Kevin Rudd, on, on, on just contact with Brian Burke, then every member of the government should be declaring to the Prime Minister, if they haven't already, yeah. what contact they've had. Because... This story obviously got out in, 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 in this week's news cycle. Um, where it came from is probably not really worth it's speculating. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty <laughs> obvious where it did come. Now, if Sorry. there are other coalition, coalition uh, ministers who've had meetings with Julian Grill or Brian Burke, um, I think they could expect a leak in the next few Stephen days. Smith declared himself this morning. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, uh, Barry, I think there are a couple of contradictions here. Um, one, the statement which came overnight from Graham Edwards. He says, and I quote, Talk about leadership being discussed at the dinner is nonsense. Mm -hmm. But I have a note here also, which I received uh, on Tuesday uh, from Kevin Rudd's office, in which he said it was Graham Edwards who said at the dinner that it was undoubtable that one day Kevin Rudd would be a Labor Prime Minister. Now, here I have Mr Rudd's office saying that Edwards said undoubtedly Kevin Rudd would be the Labor Prime Minister. And here I have Mr Edwards saying yeah. that it was nonsense. It's an unremarkable comment to make, but nevertheless it goes to leadership. And, well, and they're does. denying that leadership was discussed. Now, you know, one of these men, one of these men is lying. And lying to Piers Ackerman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's make another point here too with the, um, the, the distinction that the Prime Minister has drawn between um, Kevin Rudd and Ian Campbell, even, even though Ian Campbell resigned. Um, he, he was arguing that, in fact, uh, Kevin Rudd is more culpable. The meeting occurred in the normal course of the operation of Senator Campbell's then portfolio. The circumstances were entirely benign. Senator Campbell was not seeking any favour, support, preferment or patronage from Mr Burke. Now, is that a bit disingenuous to, to argue that, in fact, Kevin Rudd is more culpable than, uh, than the minister who was doing government business with Brian Burke? I think, uh, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, John Howard wants the attention on Kevin Rudd, and that's why Ian Campbell is out of the way. But Ian Campbell is a minister that was a minister of the Crown at the time. He's also a Western Australian politician, first off, and uh, Brian Burke approaches him uh, in a crowded room. He then chooses to talk to him for 20 minutes. I think you do have to question Ian Campbell's judgment. I think the Prime Minister has already made a call that uh, Ian Campbell's judgment is, uh, is a little I, off on this I, particular I, I, story. You know, I think that there is slightly different. I take uh, Brian to his point here that um, this was a meeting called by Julian Grill. Uh, it was a meeting on behalf of uh, a respectable institution, the uh, uh, what's called, I think, Perth Racing now, but it was the old WA Turf Club, you know, which has a huge uh, uh, membership, and very popular, you know, the sport of horse racing and so on. Um, as a, as a senior uh, a government pol federal politician, uh, you, would, you would take that meeting. Now, how you would deal with the fact that when a group of respectable Perth 
people turn up representing the racing club, that's their, they're the committee, one assumes, but they have in tow not Mr Grill but his partner, and then you, you have to turn to these blokes and say, well, uh, sorry, you guys can come in, but your mate has to wait in the corridor. I think that um, you make the call... Would have well, been a good call to make. It, it, in, in hindsight, uh, but nobody knows, in fact, whether Campbell spoke to, to, to the business people and whether, whether Burke was sitting in the corner in his dark glasses and Borsellino or Panama hat or whatever he's wearing, um, or whether, whether it was Burke v Campbell. I mean, let's, mm. have, the, let's, have, the, let's have the stewards' inquiry. Let's get the racetrack people out here. <laughs> I think you can assume um, Campbell spoke with Burke. I think he said that much but, for the public record. But you also and had he's the, the first state... minister to uh, get the chop since 1997. Yeah, but George, you also mm. had the state MP for the area present. And you also had a young man, uh, I believe, that on behalf of an Aboriginal cultural centre, which was being touted as part of this development, who's being spoken of as an ALP candidate. Now, how do you, as, the, as a federal politician, tell one, a, one an up-and-coming young Indigenous individual, two, a state member, three, a group of uh, a respectable Perth business people representing the racing industry, that, that this other fellow rules them all out. But well, as a Liberal Senator from Western Australia, you know that well, uh, the former uh, Western Australian Premier, Labor Premier, had banned all contact with his government. So I don't, now, know, why, you I don't know, know why this... But Piers, well, surely, all that... Surely, no, isn't it that the whole point, surely? If you, as a Federal member, know that the, the Labor Premier is ruling, don't you, as the Federal Opposition Leader, know the same thing? But all that um, is, is beside the point to an extent because Ian Campbell has said, well, I did the wrong thing and I'm out of here. No, he but hasn't said that. He said he did well, nothing wrong. <laughs> well, I'm, wrong but I'm out of here. He said, I'm, I'm out of thing. here because I stand between John Howard and Kevin <laughs> exactly. Rudd. And if John Howard's swinging at Kevin Rudd, yeah. I want yeah. that to continue. I, want to take... I wonder, though, whether there was a lack of um, candour on Kevin Rudd's part right from the start. Um, he, he gave that news conference on the first day and then the very next morning he fronted up, as he always does, on yes. the Friday morning mm. um, on Sunrise. We'll have a look at a, a bit of that. But at that time, you had leadership aspirations. You must have talked to him about the leadership issue. Did he help you with the leadership? Was he like one of your numbers men in oh, WA? Did you talk about it? Not at all. You uh, must have talked about the leadership. I've You're not telling us you didn't talk about the leadership. What, I'm, what I said yesterday is what I absolutely um, is what absolutely occurred. We talked about the state of national politics, state of state politics, and we had a very wide-ranging set of conversations about that. See, the, the issue there is not that, that uh, he met with Brian Burke, he admits that with a lack of mm. judgment. It's how he handles himself, how he's handled himself up until now and how he handles himself in the next few days. Mm. Mm. He's shown a glass jaw, I think. That was the first thing that I think the government noticed. He almost over-explained. He should have said sorry and been done with it. But he said a lot without actually giving us a full account of what happened in the meeting. That's why they're jumping all over him at the moment. It wasn't mm. a meeting, it was a dinner with about 20 or more people there. Yes. On this occasion, well, yeah. the main moment. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there are still contacts on other yeah. two occasions. And it was it was a meet and greet, and and the reality is that four days beforehand, Brian Burke sent out an email to the people attending, perhaps as host, announcing that this would be their opportunity to meet a future leader of the opposition uh, or government. Sorry, but actually, the point about whether leadership was discussed or not. I mean, Kevin well, Rudd in Kevin Rudd says it was. Kevin Rudd in 2005, when he talks about national politics, is saying, oh, by the way, below the line, one day I'd like to be opposition leader. You don't have to actually have a specific discussion about the numbers and of the Labor leadership. And what the point that most of the people there were Beasley supporters anyway, and in fact remain Beasley supporters, mm. with the exception of Graham Edwards, and two, two out of nine, I think, from the West, supported Kevin, Kevin Rudd, Rudd in so the end. That wasn't his state. Is, is, that, a, is that a legitimate point to make? That, it, probably, it, probably, it, probably, anyway. it probably is a legitimate point to make, but I mean, we're getting, we're getting to a, a level of detail here that the Prime Minister wants Kevin Rudd buried in. Um, what's he done in the long run? Kevin yeah. Rudd has had three meetings with... Uh, uh, this was ill-advised. Yeah. And, th and, and he was staying with Graham Edwards. Graham Edwards, as he says, is a very close friend of Brian Burke's. And I just find it's totally... It, it's, 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 it's a humbug. Or to use Edward's words, it's a nonsense to suggest that during the time he was hosting uh, uh, mm. Kevin Rudd, he didn't tell Kevin Rudd that Brian Burke was involved. I just, just want to um, put a hypothetical situation. If Ian Campbell had never met with Brian Burke, just how good would Peter Costello's performance in the Parliament have been? I mean, it was one yeah, of the absolutely. best hatchet jobs I've ever seen in a long time. But he did it with humour, he did it with ridicule, yeah. he did it with confected outrage or whatever it was. We'll just have a look at it from a different perspective now, the, the way that he used humour to introduce the topic. 
The Leader of the Opposition was staying with the member for Cowan. He had nothing to do that night, so the member for Cowan said, why don't we go down to Perugino's? And guess who was there? Oh. The man in the of hat. <laughs> Mr Brian Burke. It, it reminded me uh, of that scene in Muriel's wedding <laughs> when, when, the, when the mistress of Bill Hunter walks into the Chinese restaurant and Bill Hunter says, Deirdre Chambers, what a coincidence. <laughs> What a coincidence! Down here at Perugino's on the 1st of August 2005. I didn't know you were going to be here, Brian. And while I'm here, I'll make a speech on China. <laughs> <laughs> that was a strong performance, but in the end, just a little too strong. Um, let's get a sense of where we are in Western Australia now. And Peter Kennedy is the ABC's uh, state political reporter in the West, and he joins us now. Uh, Peter, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, How is Alan Carpenter and his government looking at uh, as the inquiry includes its, uh, concludes its evidence? Well, I think they're looking pretty bruised, Barry, but uh, probably as well as could be expected. Remember uh, a week or three weeks of hearings from that Triple C, uh, and in the past week he sacked two ministers and also uh, stripped Shelley Archer of membership of two committees. But uh, essentially he's tried to, uh, having done that, make it business as usual. On Friday morning, for instance, he launched a water recycling project. In the afternoon he announced the uh, new ministerial portfolios and took the new ministers off to government house uh, to be sworn in. So look, essentially, he's trying to get on with it. Uh, of course, it's never business as usual and there's a, the ministers are on a merry-go-round as they are, but is there serious discussions uh, about an election to clear the air? Well, there's a bit of encouragement uh, for an early election coming from the, uh, from the local media, but not much encouragement coming from the opposition. The opposition leader uh, indicated this week he wasn't all that keen on an early election. He wasn't going to push it uh, very hard because just a month ago, there was a by-election uh, to replace Norm Marlborough. Remember, he was the minister mm. who had the special uh, mobile telephone link with Brian Burke and mm. was sacked in disgrace in December. A by-election for his seat. And, in fact, the, the Labor Party improved its ground slightly. Safe Labor seat, of course. Labor Party improved its ground. The Liberal Party uh, sort of went backwards marginally. So not much encouragement there for the opposition. And as far as the Premier is concerned, he says no early election. An early election would be a sign of weakness. He says he just wants to clean up the mess. Now you mentioned Shelley Archer and I mentioned her early, uh, earlier. Would she present as a sort of a test case or does she present as a sort of a test case for the Premier? Well, uh, he was roundly criticised in some quarters for not uh, sacking her from the Labor Party on Thursday when, uh, when uh, her evidence was given at the Triple C. Uh, at, but and, and uh, he stripped her of two committees and some people said, well, that was a bit of a cop-out. But look, there are, uh, there's, there's a couple of important things here that have to be borne in mind with regard to Shelley Archer. She's a member of the Upper House. The g government, Labor doesn't have a majority in the Upper House. It has a working majority in cooperation with the Greens. If he uh, insisted that she resign, if she was sacked from the Labor Party, the, the, the government loses its working majority. And then who would have the balance of power in the Upper House? Shelley Archer. Or and maybe Shelley Brian Archer Burke. married to? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the point. This is the point. I mean, it was made earlier. Shelley Archer's husband, Kevin Reynolds, uh, influential union official. John Howard's been trying to get him for 10 years. Her mentor is Brian Burke. So who would her advisers be uh, as sitting as an independent? Kevin Reynolds, Brian Burke. And who would the government uh, look to to get its legislation through who h held the balance of power? Shelley Archer, or as you say, perhaps Brian Burke. And I think that's the last thing Alan Carpenter would want. Peter Kennedy, fascinating insight. Thanks for your time this morning. Well, it's, a, it's a legitimate point, isn't it? That if um, Shelley Archer says quite openly, Brian Burke is my mentor, I, and, and if she had the balance of power, if the Labor Party had sacked her, she would say, oh, I'll check that with Brian Burke before I give you approval for anything. <laughs> Suddenly he's got the balance of power. But as she said the other day, uh, Barry, that um, uh, she would tell Alan, Alan Carpenter that, that he was a family friend and she would not abide by his dictate. Mm -hmm. She would not... Uh, Terrible position to be. ...not accept her leader's decision. This shows the lack of wisdom of doing, going to dinners organised by Burke or anything else. It's not because he's a lobbyist, per se. It's no. not even because he's gone to jail, per se. It is because of his immense influence in a particular mm. political uh. party, the Labor Party, where he, um, in the end, what he can have over you is that he'll work against you if you don't do mm. what he wants. Mm. And I think this applies to all political parties. There are some other lobbyists in this position, too, who've got immense political power, who are seeking favours from governments. And I think 
uh, government ministers need to be keeping these people at arm's length. So, In fact, lobbyist is almost too polite a term. He's, well, he's, he's just a power broker. Yeah, he's a power broker. Yeah. 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 Now, there's a, a vacancy in the ministry, of course. Let me put some names forward. Christopher Pine, Tony Smith, Greg Hunt, Theresa Gambaro. Any of those leap out at you? There's one that should leap out for John Howard, Christopher Pine. Um, Christopher Pine's seat is a lot closer than I think the, uh, the people in the sort of national media have been paying attention just now. He's got... Uh, he's only sitting on a 6% margin and there are double digit swings in Adelaide if you believe the Adelaide Advertiser poll that was taken sort of in late mm. January, early February. I think they want to get him into the ministry as quickly as possible to uh, shore that seat up. OK, now you think Ian Campbell had a bad week. I think the other minister, Ian, Ian McFarlane, had a bad week as well on the whole question of uh, mm. nuclear power plants. Let's uh, first of all have a look at how he handled himself uh, outside the parliament and inside the parliament. When did you first know that they were planning to develop a nuclear power plant somewhere? Well, I, um, I've seen the press reports this morning and... Uh, but when did you first know? Well, as I've just said, I don't recall meeting the three of them together. I don't recall them talking to me about it. And given the Minister has now been asked this question four times and has refused to answer, what does the Minister have to hide about the government's nuclear reactor plans for Australia? We have absolutely nothing to hide about oh, our yeah. nuclear policy. Order. Can I also say that I don't recall discussing this proposal with these three gentlemen. And, uh, Order. and if, Order. If, if, Remember, someone, Jagger, Jagger. if someone is able to remind me of when I did, I will correct the record. <laughs> Covering your back. Mm. Look, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a great performance by, from you by any means, and I think that was pretty much the view of some of the ministers. In fact, when Peter Cost it was put to Peter Costello at a doorstop, mm. this is the response the media got. You can remember your conversation, and the Prime Minister can. Yet the industry minister either can't remember it or actually didn't have one. Are you surprised he didn't know about it? Ron Walker is quite a memorable chap. <laughs> <laughs> Treasurer, and you and I, I genuinely remember speaking to him. He's one of those people in life I have to look up to, actually, when I, when I talk to them. Perhaps Peter Costello was looking to knock off one of their ministers and he didn't get McFarlane, so he went for Campbell <laughs> instead. <laughs> but, Barry, I think that the important thing is to remember that this whole Brian Burke th episode was opened up because of this attempt by Labor to smear... Uh, Ron Walker, Robert de Krepney, uh, and uh, uh, Hugh Morgan, and uh, uh, by innuendo that, that they had leaked information yeah. to the PM. I thought for a while there was a standoff you and know. both sides were going to sort of move away, mm. but, yeah. but in the end it but exploded. This, but this was, the, this was the, the key. And this is the, the, but they didn't know where it was going to go. And it was like having a royal commission. Mm. They, they pulled the pin on that hand grenade, they rolled it out, forgetting that uh, 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 certainly Walker, maybe Morgan, had spoken to Steve Brax here, they'd spoken to the Premier of uh, South Australia oh, sure, yeah. about the same thing. Yeah, but more it, broadly it, on the issue though, Brian, too, in, and, and there, there a poll released over the weekend that, that shows that support for nuclear power plants is better now than it, than it was, it's, mm. it's improving. Um, are you surprised that, that John Howard is so determined to run on this? Because presumably um, it will require legislation. It's well, illegal at the moment. Of course it's we'll, illegal. We'll know he's serious when he repeals the law he brought in in 1999 outlawing the building of nuclear power plants in Australia. Then he has to really get cracking on setting out the regulations for the uh, safe disposal of the, mm. the radioactive waste, regulations to uh, safeguard against terrorist attacks on the plants and on the movement of the materials. And then he has to either put a, a, a price differential on, on coal so that nuclear becomes uh, competitive or a subsidy for nuclear, until those things happen. Well, he won't do the latter because Peter Costello has sort of all, uh, drawn a, a point of difference already by mm. saying, look, we're not mm. going to make it easy for the industry. They've got to stand on its own two feet. That's and right. It's got to be economic. Well, mm. yeah. but, but is that Peter Costello just simply um, being in a position where, well, I wasn't as gung-ho on it as, as John Howard? Peter Costello stops it from happening if, if you follow through the logic of his argument. If the industry requires a subsidy to get off the ground and, or, to, or, and, and, and to continue to operate. Or a price on carbon. And John Howard well, is basically moving towards that. Then but you but don't does need he a want subsidy. the legislation? Does he, if he introduces legislation between now and the election, mm. he's making the election a referendum Barry, on nuclear this power. Is, this, is, you know, this is so premature. You've got to understand that, that as, as Brian correctly points out, it's illegal at the moment. Any, any possibility of building a nuclear power plant, and Labor says they're going to be popping up and down the coast, and like, you know, breeding like rabbits on Macquarie Island, the, the, the reality is that it takes 15 to 20 years for a nuclear plant to be built. 
but it takes three months to change the law. It's all well, why? That's when the debate starts. But, exactly. But if, exactly. if nuclear energy has got to be economical, then, then you ha either have the price support or you're going to have to pay for your coal to be, become clean coal. So that's going to boost the price. So at what, at what point will the price of coal be, be such that, that nuclear energy starts to look attractive? Mm. You get the feeling that John Howard was trying to uh, wedge labour on this, hoping that they wouldn't in increase the number of mines that could export uranium. And labour in turn is trying to wedge him on the, uh, on, you know, you mustn't have nuclear power plants because they're supposed to be unpopular. I mean, I, 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 don't, I think Labor's in a bit of a bind here. There's no reason why you shouldn't have political uh, so have nuclear power plants, provided they're safe, etc., and provided they're commercial. To, to, to a certain extent, though, and the PM does think out aloud on a lot of these issues. He does, he does look for a form of words that that can connect a debate for him. Mm. The nuclear topic at the moment is still a conviction issue for him, and it doesn't hurt him in the short run because he's standing up for something he believes yeah, in. Okay, we just, I just want to go back sorry. to just before we go to talking pictures, um, back to the Maxine McHugh issue. Um, it's, it's now been revealed she, she, she's had death threats uh, and that uh, a couple of people were seen under her car with torches and around the car. Um, Bob Brown says that the Prime Minister ought to come out and condemn this. Is he a has he got a responsibility to, to say something on this and, and condemn what's going on? Barry, may I say this? You know, as a columnist, I receive death threats as, as a matter of course, which I never publicised, and I'm sure that that George and perhaps Brian has, and maybe you have, I don't know. You've got a beauty this week, actually. Well, there you go. <laughs> now, the, I, think, I think that it's, it's, it's highly irresponsible, quite frankly, for Maxine or Maxine's people to have, uh, uh, whoever leaked this, to, to have given it any oxygen well, whatsoever. Well, it's, it's irresponsible of people to make the death threats as well. Yeah. well and it's also a bit troubling when somebody is under, under, your, under your, car. your car with a yeah. torch. And, and, and the neighbours contacted the police. And so, so if the Prime it. Minister can do something just to put an end to this by, by making a public statement, listen, this is, this is beyond contempt, would that help? The, the normal view of the police is that it's not a good idea to publicise these things because it only yeah. invites other mm. people yeah. to come out with a copycat sort of thing. So normally they like to keep these things... Quite. It doesn't mean they shouldn't try to catch those responsible. Absolutely. But, uh, Perhaps but in this instance, uh, though, if they do take it seriously enough to publicise it. It should be removed from it. the political arena, mm. is what I'm saying. Mm. It's a matter for security people uh, and for politicians to comment or, or give it any status whatsoever. It's highly irresponsible. OK, on the panel this morning, Brian Tui, George Miligenis and Piers Ackerman. They'll be back in a few minutes, but time now for Mike Bowers and his regular segment, Talking Pictures. I'm Michael Bowers and I'm pictorial editor with the Sydney Morning Herald. I'm talking pictures this morning with Bruce Petty, your cartoons for the age. Welcome to the program, Bruce. Good day, Mike. Well, Dick Cheney came and went and sort of made less of a splash than the Queen Mary too. You took the uh, strategy that um, um, it was uh, nice to be amongst friends. Run us through what's happening here. These two people with buckets on their head, I'm trying to suggest that uh, actually these two leaders um, really don't see what's going on, you know, they refuse to, to see all the information that suggests the Iraq invasion was a, was a failure and he say it's good to find people who see things the same as we do, which is nil. It's a bit a long time coming but the Prime Minister seems to finally be facing a, a rather strong candidate in the northern Sydney seat of Benelong um, in the form of former ABC presenter Maxine McHugh. How did you read that, Bruce? Yeah, well... He's got a few problems and I think Mark's got the image right there, a very worried penguin, not dancing very well, I would think. Well, Mark, is so, he so often does brings the two things together with uh, domestic politics and the Oscars exactly. and he's got uh, not so happy feet with uh, John Howard in his electorate here. Um, yeah, it's just a nice drawing, that one, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think he, uh, it's, this is just a, a classic case of messing with his head? Messing with his head? Well, it's an odd, that's an odd line. I don't know whether that's going to do much for, for Kevin Rudd, but, um, but there's, there's a Warren messing with <laughs> graphically with the, the man's head, which shows how desperate cartoonists get <laughs> with this man. We've had him so long. I love this one of, um, of Bill Leakes. He's, yeah. got, uh, he's got a Prime Minister, a very scared Prime Minister, yes. who's qu quite old and frail looking with uh, a, the glamorous young candidate and, and, and Mrs Howard is saying, you're dreaming about that woman that, again, aren't you? Right. <laughs> that's typical. Leake, he's got just about every politician's been intimate. You know, bedroom scenes one way or another with a bit of politics. 
Well, the, uh, the power of a different kind, uh, rather than the power of politics, but rather nuclear power sort of raised its uh, head and, and many of the cartoons picked up on a similar theme. Ron Tanberg's got uh, the knot in my backyard with John Howard sort of pointing Ron Walker with his cooling funnel over to Kevin Rowe. Yeah. Yeah, that's, we're going to hear a lot about you know, the backyard scene, you know, Chernobyl. We're going to, I must say, it doesn't seem to worry a lot of other countries. They've gone past all that, but we're going to go through it. I think if we're going to have one of these awful bits of apparatus, um, Backyard, that's right. <laughs> well, Industry Minister Ian McFarlane was caught uh, off guard with questions about his link to the nuclear investors Ron Walker and Hugh Morgan and the gang. Um, he certainly didn't look too comfortable. No, no, that's... Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, about photographers, I mean, they must be always able to find a shot of a, of a politician who looks <laughs> like that poor man does. <laughs> Where are you supposed to do that? Is that ethical to do that? Oh, you, are you <laughs> suggesting we would try and manipulate the pictures so that they would say something? Well, if you take 50 <laughs> shots of anybody, you're going to get one to make, make us all look like that. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you very much for taking the time this morning. Thanks, Mike. Now, just on the education issue, and uh, Labor has proposed a national curriculum, as Mark Latham did, and the government uh, even now, um, when Stephen Smith put this idea up, uh, the Education Minister, Julie Bishop, admonished him in the Parliament. He talks about his education revolution. Naughty boy, you stole that idea, didn't you? <laughs> you have to go to the naughty corner, won't you? <laughs> That was quite an effective parliamentary <laughs> contribution too, I thought. But uh, look, what, what's your thoughts on a national curriculum? Well, I, I'm not too keen on it. I, I believe that diversity is very important. Uh, I don't want every student throughout Australia on the same day reading the same novel, that sort of thing. You can take it much too far. And uh, this whole... Then it comes down to who sets the, the curriculum, and particularly both sides are talking about heavily fact-based things on history and that. I mean, Julie Bishop was saying she wants all Australian children to know why did Captain Cook sail down the east coast of Australia? Her answer is because he was on a scientific expedition. What happens to the kid who says it was because he actually took possession of, a, of, of the east coast of Australia on behalf of Britain on an island now called, imaginatively enough, Possession Island? Do they get marked wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I, Brian, I, that's, you're fine. The arts thing is a, is a, re, is, is a mire yeah. already. We know yeah. that. But let's look at uh, topics like science and mathematics mm. and so forth, where you actually have, you know, in all sort of areas of calculus, you've got fairly finite ar uh, arguments mm. and, and things. Mm. I, I, I do think that we need to well, boost these, and I think it's ridiculous. Mm. I mean, one of the one of the, the points which wasn't made about Western mm. Australia was that they've just uh, reappointed that idiot woman uh, who was the education minister and was sacked and put her back in cabinet. But, but Piers, your argument goes to more, more towards what, what should be in it. It's the question of a national curriculum. I mean, if you get a state like New South Wales and say, look, we've got the best system in, in Australia, why should we compromise for the benefit of the others? I'm talking about content. Yes, I know you are. Yeah. But, but, but the issue seems to be whether, whether it's a good idea to do it when you might drag down somebody who's already meeting standards. Well, I, so. wouldn't, I don't think that a lot of people would agree, uh, even though the, the New South Wales uh, curriculum may be the best in the country, it may not be world class. Uh, that's why so many people are putting their kids through the baccalaureate. Ke Kevin Rudd's position is that, uh, that, that the standard would raise for all states, that they'd get the best from each state and uh, make that the national benchmark. Even if you were to accept that argument, what then follows is that you set a cap on, um, on, the, on the continuous the improvement, to borrow some of the jargon in these debates. Um, I think we're still, it's, 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 still a, it's still a state responsibility. I think one of the things that Rudd wants to uh, establish in this debate is that he can get the cooperation of the premiers, where John Howard wants to bludgeon them into submission. But can he get the teachers' unions? And they've been the well, sticking point. He, he's ex excluded the teachers' yeah. unions from the board, which is yeah. not a bad start. I think we're overstating the concerns about standards in Australia. There was a, a big study done of Australian... Uh, of, sorry, Australian students compared to 27 other countries, the developed countries in the world. We came second. This is at age 15. Second in literacy, that's not bad. Uh, fourth in problem solving and sixth in maths. I think we're, where the problem is is with people at the, in the bottom of the class and they need a lot more attention. But otherwise, Australian students are uh, turning out pretty well. I but think. the other argument is that 80,000 kids yeah. move into state year after year. Is that an exaggerated problem? Well, in Queensland, it's not an exaggerated problem because most of them are going to Queensland and mm. to a lesser extent uh, Western Australia. So you've yeah, got a different you, curriculum. Do you, you think they're <laughs> lifting the standards in those states by moving there? <laughs> OK, a final observation or a prediction, Brian Tui? 
Well, I think it'll be a while before the Defence Minister, Brendan Nelson, makes an offensive comparison that the, the same level of threat was facing Australia from terrorists in Iraq as it was faced in uh, 1942 when 600 Australians died on the Kokoda Trail. Uh, he's, he's saying that uh, it's the same threat because we're fighting terrorists in, in Iraq. We're not even fighting them, but no sensible person thinks that the, the same level of threat uh, is faced today. George. If they haven't already got the list, the Prime Minister's office will have a list of every every trivial contact uh, that every coalition MP has had with either Brian Burke or Julian Grill by the end of the week. Piers. I think David Hicks, uh, US uh, defence attorney, uh, Mori, uh, becoming a bit of a celebrity out here, but he should acknowledge that he was the one who put the plea bargain on the table back on January 26 and, um, and explain why he doesn't want a speedy trial now. And that's it for this week. I'll be back with Offsiders at 10.30, but coming up next, Alan Kohler and Inside Business.